So last weekend, I was at YE Church. I play in the brass band there. So every now and again, I'll have a Sabbath off. And it's not really a Sabbath off. It's just so I can blow my own trumpet, right? (laughs) And last weekend was that weekend. I rushed from there to here so I could do some videoing. And I I videoed a whole group of people. And this is their story. So thanks, um, thanks, team. When did you first come to believe in Jesus? Um, I was very fortunate because I grew up as an Adventist, so I was born into the Adventist church. I've only ever been in church, but we became Adventists. My first recollection is living on a farm and Pastor Murchison came out and gave mum and dad Bible studies. And when we moved into the town, mum and I went to church. I would have been about seven then. Um, I was brought up in a Christian home and I probably, I didn't really think much about it until I was about nine. It's like around nine-ish that I started to actually really think about like why I was coming, what I was doing with my life and whatever. Well, oh, I, uh, I don't really know when because I grew up as a, as, a, as a Seventh-day Adventist, you know? So um, maybe as I was growing up, I, I understand more of Jesus and the Lord. Well, we, we did a lot of um, JMVs and Pathfinders and things like that. So um, even from very young, uh, we, we had a, as, as kids, we, we, we believed in Jesus and we sang a lot of songs about Jesus, but it wasn't until probably pathfinders and teenagers that we um, started to really uh, get to know Jesus and, and pray and have some little little miracles take place in our, in our own lives and things. I've always, I've always believed, to be honest, um, there's never been really any doubt about that, um, but uh, maybe my relationship with Jesus uh, has probably been sort of uh, kicked into gear over the last couple of years. I don't remember, I was very little and just grew up knowing him and coming to Sabbath school and all of that. Uh, I grew up in a, like a, I grew up believing in Jesus. Oh, I probably always knew of him growing up, but didn't really like him as a kid because he had long hair. Right. And as a kid, we always associated that as long hair being a girl. So I didn't, I always like, I like God, didn't really like Jesus. Okay. So it was like teenage years where I'm just like, time to grow up. Well, I have been born in Seventh-day Adventist family. I am actually the five generation of Adventists in my family, or it's been always part of my life. Probably when I was four or five. Do you mean like believe that it's there, believe the stories, or... Yeah, you know, get good. to know God because I was brought up with my parents reading me Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories. Yeah. When I was at primary school, <coughs> year six, the last year of primary school in WA, I had a teacher who started teaching evolution, and that really made me think, this isn't true, and what, what am I going to do about it? So I talked to mum and dad, and we started some Bible studies with my sister and myself and another friend. And that led to baptism when I was about 13. There we go. There's some stories there about what, and and there's some things in common in those stories, isn't there? What was the thing that was mostly in common? Growing, Growing up in an Adventist family. I think we should just put our hands together for Adventist families, right? How, how incredible is that? Yeah. It's like, for, for all our children growing up in the church, it's like, wow, the first thing they get to know is actually they're growing up in a place where, where faith is affirmed, where, where God is believed, where Jesus is Lord and Savior, where all of those things are happening. And I think, wow, how, how amazing is that, right? That's just, just so, so important. And... And then even more than that is kind of like that, that they're growing up there and then they're being nurtured in their faith. And guess what? They're still at church. In fact, um, one, one person I interviewed last week, I didn't use his video because he, um, but at, at the moment, although I, I will in the, the next one I put together, 
and it was just like his answer to the question, why did you get baptized? And his answer was so delicious, I loved it. And his answer was, I got baptized because I got a 10% discount on the school fees. It's like, how cool is that? And, and, and as I was chatting with my son, Andrew, he's just like, well, Dad, we need to turn that into a thing and make sure that we get more baptisms with more people getting discounts at schools so that they can rock along to church as well. And here he was, 40, 50 years later, still attending church. His conversion came later. It doesn't matter when it comes. The fact is it comes and, and we get to grow with God. So this is the start of a, a little mini-series that, that I've called Growing with God. This is part one. There's another couple of parts coming. And, and as, as what this, part, this series is really looking at is the spiritual journey of faith that we go through. And here's the, here's the, the, the text I want us to refer to. So open your Bibles to Ephesians. If you've got technology there, use it. Otherwise, you can just read it off the screen, but that's cheating. I, I like you to open it up because you'll get distracted from what I'm saying and you'll read the word and that's kind of cool as well. So Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. Okay, so in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says this. In fact, I'll start in verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in where? In the inner man. So what's he saying? He's saying, hey, what God wants, he wants you to be strengthened inside. All right, why? Well, because there's all sorts of reasons why. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in what? In love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the height, the width, the length, the depth, to know, to know the, the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with what? All the fullness of God. So, church, here's my question for you. Are you filled with all the fullness of God? Oh, well, how would you even know the answer to that? Well, let me tell you, it doesn't matter what your answer is. The answer would have to be no. You could be in heaven for, for, for like a while, I would think, and the answer would be that you'd still be no because there's still more, right? We get to grow, and so our growth isn't just, oh, well, I get to grow, and then one day Jesus will take me home. No, I get to grow now, but I get to grow through all of eternity, so I get to experience more because God is infinite, isn't he? So how can I have all of the fullness of God if God's infinite? It's so there's this growth factor that's going on here that I get to grow, and I keep on what? I keep on growing. Now, unfortunately, some of us may end up looking like a little bonsai. You know what a bonsai looks like? I've seen bonsai gum trees. Um, it was on one of the garden shows the other day. I walked into my mum's room, and she's looking at bonsai. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing. Look at those trees. Bonsai gum trees, about this big, just looking like an old, really old gum tree. And I'm like, oh, that's magnificent. But we shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't be bonsai. We should be bonsai. We should be growing, right, and maturing and developing and all of those things. And then it goes on. Here is Philippians 4, verse 13, where it says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, that word there needs some unpacking, perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what, is, what Paul is trying to say is, hey, all of this, you know, these spiritual gifts given to church so people can serve in church, so people can do all of these things, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers and preachers, and, and some with the gift of hospitality and others with the gift of sound and, and others with the gift of voice and singing and leading worship, all of those gifts are all for the purpose so we can what? We can grow till we reach this thing called what? Perfection. And I like to think of that in this word because I think it's a better way of understanding the word maturity. 
Because our way of thinking of perfection is, ooh, squeaky clean, nothing wrong, absolute, you know, the magic perfection, doesn't ever do anything wrong kind of thing. That's our idea of perfection, but it's not the, the idea of perfection being described here. What's being described here is the state of maturity, that you have matured. And I wish... That, that we actually had more of that going on, that we should no longer be children, Paul says, tossed to and fro and carried around on, on every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head that is Christ. Um, in fact, going on, you know, Michelle Van Loon says this in, in her book, Becoming Sage, and I, I like this, she says, many churchgoers and clergy struggle to articulate a basic understanding of spiritual maturity. So let me ask you before we go on, what does it mean to be spiritually mature? Oh, I'm loving the answer. <laughs> All right, oh, you go, Adrian. Confident of salvation. I like that. I think that's a subset of it. And I think that's an important subset of it. Great, great start. So being spiritually mature is being confident. Jesus said in, in John chapter 3 that if you have, you know, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have. Just like I have the remote control. And all the fellas know that that's the most powerful thing in the home, right? You get the remote control and you have the power, right? You have it. All right, what else? What else is, does it mean to be spiritually mature? To be walking with Christ. I like that. We can be little children walking with Christ, can't we? Absolutely. Baptized my sister's son at the age of eight. It's like, whew, that's young, isn't it? Turned a few heads, that one did. Guess who he is? You may have seen some of his work. Emmanuel Higgins? Name ring a bell for some of you? Producing those videos of choirs singing, runs music camp and all sorts of other things. It doesn't matter. If you're sincere in your heart at that age, that can set the trajectory for your life. It may not, but it can. Depends on the scaffolding around the young life to help the young life grow. But there's a commitment at that age. You can make a commitment in your teen years. Is that a full-on commitment? Yes, it is. But is there more growth to happen? Yes, there is. You can make a commitment in your late teens and young adult years. And is that a full-on commitment? Yes, it is. But is there more to come? Yes, there is. There's much more to come. You could be a late bloomer and make a commitment in late life. And is there more to come? Yes, there is. There is. There's so much more to come in the Christian life. And this idea of spiritual maturity, she goes on to say that, that people aspire to be spiritually mature, but they don't know what it means. Pastors want to guide others on the path to spiritual wholeness, but they're often not clearly defining the goals or the outcomes of that process. In other words, there's a lack of clarity around, well, what's the goal? Maybe the goal is to be more like Jesus, but that's still a little fuzzy. Because what does that mean? Does it mean that I need to gird myself in a cloth and walk around and, and go visit people and, and have no home at all? And, and is that spiritual maturity? Because the church in the dark ages tried that, embracing poverty and, and chastity and all of those things and, and decided that this was the way to live life. Is that spiritual maturity? Or is spiritual maturity something else that's applied to our life that we keep growing in? Reading on a little bit further, I'm sorry, the writing's so small. One day we will get bigger screens up front. I'm looking forward to that day. I won't have to zoom in so much. Um, but this is what it says. The Barna Servo revealed that in the church we have widely differing ideas of what it means to become sage. 
all right? So if you think of what it is, so, you know, if you use John Eldridge's idea of what the progression through life is, you're the child, then you're the shepherd, then you're the warrior, then you're the lover, then you're the king, and then finally you're the sage who's full of wisdom of life that you can pour back. So here, here the research is saying that in order to become sage, right, What's needed is when asked to define maturity, 20% of self-identified Christians couldn't answer the question at all. They had no idea what maturity looked like. 80% offered responses that included having a relationship with Christ, following the rules, choosing a moral lifestyle, practicing what personal spiritual disciplines, possessing faith, applying the Bible's principles, or being involved in the local congregation. Now, all of those are good answers, but it's not the answer of what it means to be spiritually mature. So what is it? Despite not being able to agree on what maturity is, more than half the adult survey reported that they believed, and this is the, this is the funny bit, that they were spiritually healthy. Right? No idea what the goal is, but I know that I'm doing okay. Good luck with that, right? We need to know where we're going. In coaching terms, we say, unless you can language something, you can't possess it because you don't know what it is. So we need to be able to put some legs around, well, what is this thing, spiritual maturity? Uh, David Kinnaman said this. He said, as people begin to realize that the concepts and practices of spiritual maturity have been underdeveloped, the Christian community is likely to enter a time of renewed emphasis on discipleship, soul care, the tensions of truth and grace, the so-called fruits of the spiritual life and the practices of spiritual disciplines. And guess what I find reading that piece of research really interesting that over about the last five, maybe ten years tops, our church has been doing what? Focusing on discipleship. Why? Because it's a neglected thing. We, 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 we're kind of going back and saying, oh, we need to disciple people. We need to disciple our members. We need to disciple people so that they can grow in this thing called the Christian faith. She goes on to say, say this, maturity isn't a fixed destination, but describes a process of growth in Christ-likeness in every area of life, in your home life as being mum, that somehow rather become a better mother because you're following Jesus. Or as Papa Bear, you become a better Papa Bear because you're following Jesus. Or a better grandparent because you're following Jesus. Or because you're a boy and a girl in the church, you're becoming a better boy and girl in church because you're following Jesus. That somehow rather, Jesus' spirit is, is infusing your life and you are growing and maturing so that you are becoming more loving, more kind, more compassionate, more considerate more filled with joy, more filled with hope, more filled with a sense of certainty and purpose to life because God is working through and in you. So that through every season of life, it's marked by an ongoing increase in self-giving love, modeled in the ministry of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the person who's growing spiritually is what? Is other-centered. They're worried about others around them. They're not worried so much about self. They're concerned for the welfare of others. She goes on to say that it's a generative, generous um, existence marked by ongoing ripening of the fruit of the Spirit. So what's the fruit of the Spirit? Remind me of that this morning. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, faithfulness, kindness, self-control. See, self-control was something I struggled with as a, a lad growing up. I still remember the day me and my brothers were playing rugby down the back, touch rugby or tackle, I can't remember. But anyway, somehow or rather I got hit a little too hard and I used to get hot-headed, I lost control and, and so I, I, I just lost it. And my brother Kevin, who's older than me, he just picked me up and dropped me in the mud. I don't know what was funny. It was not funny, that was just terrible. And, and, and years later, my brother Kevin remembered that story and he apologized for dropping me in the mud. And I said to him, actually, you didn't need to apologize at all. I just totally lost it. I wasn't cool. I deserved that. And I needed to actually grow up. Yeah, it's this idea of growing up, isn't it? 
in, in the book, The Critical Journey, lists these, and these are the, the stages that I want to look at over the next couple of weeks. And the reason, and you might wonder why it is that I'm choosing to do this as a little mini-series, right? At the start of this year, I taught a, a subject at Avondale University, and the subject was um, biblical spirituality in, mini- in ministry. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, this is a great topic. And, and the more I studied and researched all the different things I had to present on, it just opened my ideas to the fact that in ministry, I'd f- focus so much on the first couple of stages. You've got you to know who God is. You've got to come to love Jesus. You've got to fall in love. You've got to be baptized. And then you've got to just, you know, go on a storm coat trip. There we go. Big tick. Youth ministry 101. Finished, complete, done. And I didn't realize, well, I did know, but I didn't focus on it. What happens after that? And what happens after that is really quite amazing. And so here's what happened about six, eight weeks ago. Oh, time goes so fast. I put a post up on my Facebook page, a quote from, this, from one of the books that I've read, which was called Becoming Sage. And the quote was how, does attending church help your spiritual growth or not? And it was along that sort of lines. And I just put it up because the quote was actually a quote from people in their community, in their life, saying how that that oftentimes the church helped them in their early stages of growth, and then it actually impeded their later stages of growth. And I'm like, ooh, don't want that kind of church, do we? So I put this post online just to sort of as a litmus test to see, is that a thing in our church community? I must say, it was like poking the bear. I had all these responses, just people, it was like a confessional. A cousin of mine made a comment on there how that she stopped attending church. She still had faith and confidence in God still had faith and confidence in Christ, but attending church proved too painful. And so many others just put their comments there that I'm looking at all of this and I'm going, wow, this is like a raw nerve and I don't want that to be a characteristic of my ministry. So I need to look at how we as a church can help people grow from the cradle to the grave, right? And I'm getting closer to the other end, so this is timely, right? It's useful to me. And hopefully this will be a blessing to you as you think in these things as well. So here it is. Here's the six stages from one of the books, um, The Critical Journey. It's a recognition of God. It's like it's an opening to, to say that God, oh, I know that there's God. And then the next stage is a life of discipleship. And then, then beyond that is the productive life and then the inward journey and the wall. Yeah, it's a thing. So if you haven't hit the wall, God bless you. If you have hit the wall, you'll know what it is. And we'll get to talk about that next week. So we're going to do these in in blocks of two. We're going to do today, we're going to look at recognition um, of God and life of discipleship. So let's move on. So here's, how do you recognize the first stage in your spiritual life? What is it characterized by? It's characterized by a sense of awe. And, and what, what we need to notice here is that God's Spirit is already moving in the world and someone responds to God's Spirit and, that, and, and the response to that is a sense of awe. It's like, ah, oh, there's more. It's an existential response that somehow or other they recognize there's more to life, there's more to what's going on. There's like, ah, oh, there's awe, there's wonder. It's like, wow, life has purpose, life has meaning. Life isn't some random evolutionary thing. Instead, we're created and it's like, wow, this is incredible. And with that, there comes a sense of need and there's a natural awareness of God that, that it's almost like life takes on a magical view. It's like, oh, wow, I can see God's handiwork here and here and here. And it's just incredible. And then there's a, there's a greater sense of, of meaning to life and there's a real sense of innocence here. And dare I say that, that if a person at this age is praying, their prayers are, are real like magical power. And I think there's magical power 
and I'm using that word carefully, because I think what God does is he honors the very simple, basic prayers of faith, and he gives almost immediate answers to those prayers. Not all the time, but often enough that it's recognized as kind of a thing. But then later on, then there needs to be a growing, leaving that behind, and a sense of dependence now, that whether I get the answer or not, I'm still going to trust. But early on, it seems like God wants to scaffold the faith, and so he's, he's giving more answers, and so people have this, oh, increased sense of awe as they journey with God. The thing is, God is at work in your life even before you respond to him. In Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, it speaks about how you were dead in your trespasses. But then what happened? That God made you alive in Christ. So that somehow rather, even before you came to know about this thing called, called faith or spiritual journey or life, and even if you're growing up in the church, it doesn't matter. There comes a point where God is working in your life even before you're consciously choosing to which way to go. Because we call that, there's a technical term for it in theology, it's called provenient grace, where God's grace is already at work in the world. Why? Because he's trying to reach people, he's trying to save people. And he's actually taking care of the power that's already at work in the world, the power of Satan. He's like warring against that. And in warring against it actually gives you free choice to choose in that moment, whether you choose for God or not. John 1, 9 says that that he's the light that comes into the world that is a light to all men. Or Romans 2, 4 speaks of the goodness of God that leads you to repentance, even though we were lost in the world and we were dead. But his, his grace comes and he saves and he redeems us. But stage one is fraught with, with risks, right? And the risks are that we might get stuck in stage one. And what's it look like if you get stuck in stage one? This is what it looks like. That you might actually have a sense of that... Um, of worthlessness and that sense of worthlessness might manifest itself by by things like saying like oh I don't measure up I'm a failure if only you knew me you wouldn't want me as part of your church family now on the one hand there's a truth to that but on the other hand it actually becomes a real sickness and a real impediment to future growth unless we can come to the point where we recognize that though I am worthless God says, I am of great value, infinite value, so much that he gave his one and only son that he would die to save me. Wow. So Paul can say he is chief of sinners, but he can also say that he's a saint. He's part of the family of Christ belonging to God. So there's a sense in which you can't stay with that perspective. You've got to move on and recognize your value and your worth as God sees you. really important. In my job as a ministerial secretary, I've often asked pastors this kind of question. And the question is, if you're, and I'm going to ask you the same question, if you're on a deserted island and you've got nothing to do, it's just you. You don't have a role, you're not a mum, you're not a grandma, you're not a granddad, you're not a dad, you're not an employee, you're not a teacher or a worker, you're not a wife, you've got none of those roles you're not a all you are is you're just on the island by yourself and if you were to rate yourself from zero which is low value and 10 high value what value would you place on yourself on that island with nothing to do first number that pops in your head if your number is really down here let me just go right over this way sorry guys with the cameras if your number's right down here and it's a zero or a one and I've met pastors with that score it's like that's not good right because they're missing something the correct answer by the way is what it's 10 so our correct answer it's a long walk to the correct answer (laughs) the correct answer is way down here somewhere it's a 10 why is it a 10 who sets my value who sets my worth 
God does. And all I've got to do is accept that. I've got to accept his value. And if I do, it moves me from this sense of worthlessness to the understanding and appreciating my incredible value in his eyes. That's a revelation that's got to come. We've got to get moving from stage one. We can't be stuck at that. And here's the thing. No matter where you, your number is, on a really good day, you'll be whatever your number is. Suppose your number was a six. You said, oh, yeah, I'm a six. So on a really good day, you'll be an eight out of ten. But on a, and you'll be thinking, oh, I'm good, but I'm not that good. So you'll go back to your six. And on a really bad day, you'll be a four out of ten, and you'll think I'm bad, but I'm not that bad, and you'll come back to your six. The truth is... As God sees you, you're a 10. You're of great value and great worth. He's willing to die just for you. How valuable does that make you? Start seeing things from a heavenly point of view. The second thing that can keep someone stuck at stage one is this idea of spiritual bankruptcy, that no one cares, not even God, no one cares for me. And it's almost like the, the person's fallen into this little pity party. And so they're, they're stuck in this little state of just thinking and seeing the world that way. And so there they are. And, and what drives it is the thinking that I'm wrong and others are right, that somehow rather I'm a mistake. There's other ways as well. And martyrdom is an interesting one. The world's a tough place. It's hard and, and, and it humiliates me and I deserve it. And so there's a sense in which someone who's stuck there may actually just have this martyr complex that the world is out to get them and so they're just sacrificing themselves for the pleasure of the world and everyone else. Or it might be ignorance. And the, the reason if they're stuck with ignorance, it goes something like this. Oh, theology's hard. Understanding faith is hard. Uh, and, and so why bother? And so they just live avoiding actually the option to grow. And as a result of that, as a result of any number of these blockages to our growth, someone can get stuck and they fail to thrive in their faith. And, and, and instead, of, instead of growing and maturing, they're staying kind of like stunted and bonsai. And it's not what God wants. He wants us growing and maturing, doesn't he? I remember the time when I first made a decision for Christ and, and my decision for Christ was like this. It was like I was, I was young. You, many of you in the video said you grew up in the church. I kind of did and didn't. So my mum was an Adventist. My dad wasn't. And, and my earliest recollections was, yeah, faith was part of the life story. But at the age of 10 was when I made a commitment to follow Jesus sitting under a little gum tree in Western Australia at at this international um, Christian fellowship camp, interdenominational. And so there I was sitting under this gum tree and there it was, I gave my heart to Jesus and and my heart was just like, oh, this is so nice. Now that decision ultimately led to baptism years later, but it actually, years later, I'm like three, three and a half years later. Fordyce Dedimore came to Kurenbong and he ran a crusade in the late 70s. And as part of that, mum took me and my sister along to that. And, and we made decisions for baptism. It's the most natural thing in the world because the fruit, I think, of this, of this stage one leads to an awareness of God and a sense of wonder and awe and, and, the, and progressing in the spiritual life till the point where you just want to commit and you want to, you want to actually go. And that leads to, to stage two, where, where in stage two, what is stage two about? A life of discipleship. After my baptism, and, and stage two isn't about baptism. Baptism can be anywhere in that growth. And here in stage two, what happens is a sense in which I've accepted who I am. I've accepted the value that God places on me. And now the church steps in. The Christian community steps in. And what did it do? Hillview Church, immediately after I was baptized, got me teaching in juniors. Now, if you were to talk to Andrea, like a few years later after that, I became Pathfinder leader. And, and I spoke about King Esther. All right, some of you are awake. The rest of you need to wake up. And, and it was just like, it was like, she's like, she spoke to me after she said, you do know that it was queen, not king. And I'm like, oh, you know, no idea, right? What was the church thinking when they put me so biblically illiterate into a kid's Sabbath school? 
What were they thinking when only a few short years later, at the age of 19, I was thrown in to be a, 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 fr- um, a friend's pathfinder leader? And then a companions, and then rangers, and then after all of that, I became the club leader. Like, what was the church thinking? The church was actually leading out in this thing of making disciples of stage two, making sure that I was included in the church community. And they weren't doing that just with me. They were doing that with the whole youth group, finding ways to plug people in, turning young people into elders in the church because they showed the signs of spiritual maturity. So it's not about age, it's about maturity and spiritual maturity. And so they were looking for those and they went, ah, okay, we'll we'll make you an elder, here we go. And it's just like, how fabulous was that? That's one of the things I love about foresters here. You have that same passion, the same vision, the same way of seeing how young people can be a vital part of community. You plug them in early. Love that. And instead of, instead of being isolated in stage two, there's a sense now in which there's a community to belong to. And I love this. And the life of discipleship at stage two is really characterized by belonging and, and answers found in beliefs. There's a sense of growing certainty. And I remember as, as a young Adventist, right, and, and what, what's happening, I'm, I'm attending church and, and some Sabbaths, I don't actually go into church takes my atheist brother to actually slap me around one Sabbath. I, I, I spent the whole of the church service in the foyer arguing with, with, a, with another man about whether you would be saved or lost if you ate meat. No, 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 you, you're missing. I was deadly serious. Helen, you shouldn't be laughing at me. And this, I'll, I'll explain why I was deadly serious, right? I was deadly serious because the, the rationale went like this. Um, Ellen White speaks about and encourages to become vegetarian. Ellen White is inspired by God. The right thing to do if you're fair dinkum about your faith is to follow what God says. So if you follow what she says, then that's what you should do. And if you don't, well, then you're not fair dinkum, which means you're on the other team. So me and my, my mate, he was the youth leader at the time, we're in the foyer and we're having this full-on argument about it and I go home and as I go home and, you know, finally arrive home and, and my brother is there and he says, so, so he says, Neil, so what happened at church today? And I says, oh, I don't know, I didn't get in. He says, what do you mean you didn't get in? I says, well, I was in the foyer chatting with, with a mate and he says, so what were you chatting about? And I says, oh, I was chatting about whether you'd be saved or not if you, did, if, if you weren't vegetarian. And he says, you're an idiot. (laughs) Technical term. He was right. I was wrong. The kingdom is not about eating and drinking. What's the kingdom about? Loving your neighbor. neighbor. It's about righteousness, peace, joy in the spirit. But see, at this age, I was just like, all right, there was a, it's very black and white at this, at this stage of faith. It's like a sense of right and wrong. And there was a real sense of certainty around, all right, that this is the right thing. This is the wrong thing. And I had great clarity around that. In fact, some would say I had great arrogance around things as well. Rigid in righteousness, right? This is what can actually keep you locked at stage two. You can become so rigid in righteousness that you could be legalistic, moralistic, black and white, that God's going to punish those who get it wrong and exclude them straight away from his family. Or that, and here's the thing, it doesn't just affect those who are conservatives. I've been in some liberal churches at stage two. If I walked into a liberal church like that, you know what they'd want to do? They'd want to rip my tie off. They say, you don't need that here. And I'm like, well, actually, I had it on this morning. I thought it looked good. Today is the start of NADOC week. This is my Aboriginal tie, and I just want to acknowledge that this is NADOC week. starts this weekend, and it goes through till next Sabbath. And, and it's just like, all right, in support of Aboriginal rights in Australia, I think this tie kind of actually says something. There we go. Acknowledgement of country. And the Guragai people on whose land we are. How fabulous is that, right? 
that we get to share in, in their country and their land. I wouldn't have had that statement when in my younger years, right? I was ready to blaze a trial. I was so certain of so many things. And yet in those certainty of those things, I was ready to run right over the top of people. I was ready to abuse people. I was ready to do all sorts of things because it's like, well, this is right, that's wrong. You know? And if that's wrong, well, then you've got to get yourself right or you can't be part of the, what's going on. And it's like, oh, wow, that's not good. And, and so it becomes a we against them is the thinking that can lock someone into this stage. And where do we see that? We see that in our church. We see that in the conflicts in our church. And by that, I'm not meaning our Forest's Beach Church. I'm meaning the church at large, where we see that, that there are people locked in at this stage too, and there are we against them. And it's, the, it's kind of like the conservatives against the liberals or those south of the Manning River against those north of the Manning River, it seems sometimes. And it's just crazy stuff, right? It really is crazy stuff. And here's the attitude and the thinking that goes with it. I'm right and others are wrong. So cocksure, so certain. And then there's a few other things that can keep someone locked at stage two, which is the the constant switches. I love this, right? And and, uh, hopefully, you know, if you recognize yourself here in any of these, then the, the appropriate response is not to feel guilty or suddenly switch churches. But the, the appropriate response is rather to recognize that God has more in store for your life. He wants you to keep growing. Don't get stuck where you are. Maturity in Christ is a thing and we need to keep growing till we reach that place. So what is this? The constant switches, what do they do? Well, they rock up to a church, they fall in love with the church, they, they connect with the community, they participate until the disappointment comes, the great disappointment comes. And when they're faced with a great disappointment, they reject that community, they, go, they grow disillusioned and they go searching for another community and then they go join that one. And then the same thing happens and they join another one and another one and another one. And somehow or rather, they never find a place to settle because what they're avoiding is themselves. The uncomfortableness, that didn't come out right, the uncomfortableness of actually confronting the problem is not in the church community. The problem resides between them and you. It's a relationship. So you have to maybe think what part do I play in that and how do I need to grow and mature and is my faith determined by individuals outside or is my faith determined by my relationship to Christ and then of course the final one is the searches and they're looking for something more real they're looking for something more intellectually satisfying less painful more rigorous if only we could actually have all of the truth figured out in certain ways then we'd have it nailed Church, I guess in some ways why I'm sharing this is because I see elements of that in me in my younger years. And God has been doing a work in my life and I I hope and pray if you see these stages or if you can resonate with these stages early on in your life, praise the Lord. If you can see yourself at these stages now, then just go hallelujah. God has a growth plan for you. And what I want you to realize is there, are, there is a growth plan for you. And that growth plan is actually one that's going to go from now through all eternity. We never graduate from growth. There's a principle which goes like this, and this is kind of like my, my wrap-up. So if our singers want to come up, they, you're very welcome to. It's this. You either use it <coughs> or you lose it. You're either growing or you're decaying. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of our brain, the way our brain works, you're either increasing the capacity of your brain or your brain is going into atrophy. True story. If you link those two fingers together, within two weeks your brain will have reassigned the control of those two fingers individually and it will now treat it as just one finger within two weeks. 
Your brain will reassign things. It's designed to actually keep on using and utilize resources in a very efficient, effective way. So if you're not using it, if you're not growing with it, if you're not maturing with it, you're actually suffering atrophy. And so what's going to happen as we go through this over the next couple of weeks as we explore this idea of growing with God, we're going to be looking at what are the things that we can do to help us grow and mature all the way through life. Does that sound like a good thing? Father, just thank you that we can gather here this morning. Bless us, Lord. Cause us to grow, disturb our status quo. Help us to mature constantly, drawing closer to you. Father, bless us and keep us, we pray in your wonderful name. Amen.